Hello and welcome to Great Britain in Focus. I'm James McCullough. And I'm Pascal Mary Rakovic. Daniel Cote Davis takes us on a journey to the beautiful Lancashire countryside in the footsteps of J.R.R. Tolkien to reflect on the inspiration behind Tolkien's works. Daniel, an enthusiast for the depth and religious significance of Tolkien's writings, shares his own insights of Christian spiritual truths hidden throughout Tolkien's famous stories. What inspired Tolkien's writings? What were his beliefs? What message can we draw for our own lives from the characters and events that he created? Let's find out. J.R.R. R. Tolkien is a master evangelist. His writings have struck the hearts of many people around the world. They have been touched by his vision, his clarity, his purpose, and the way his imagination captivates human experience and the longing for God. J.R.R. R. Tolkien had a real way of expressing deeply the truth of man as being homo viator, the man who journeys. And where does that journey take place? It happens on the Camino de Esperanza. This really means that the journey itself is a journey of hope. And through trial and suffering, there is a hope that animates the quest. And so we're going to go on our own journey. We're going to head out to the Ribble Valley where Tolkien himself walked many of his journeys, followed many trails and many hidden paths. And this is really what captivated his soul and helped him to write many of his stories that we're so familiar with. We've just taken the train for an hour outside of Manchester, beautiful rolling hills spreading out across the horizon. It's fantastic to think about Tolkien walking around upon the trails and really witnessing the beauty of creation. I'm reminded this morning when I was reading the Saxon Gospels of the call of God to Abraham to go out on a journey of obedience from darkness and spiritual agony into the light of a vision. And I'm going to read to you that passage now. God wolde te fandian Abrahames ye hirsum nesse, and clipode his naban. Go forth and hei te landes visiones. God wanted to test Abraham's obedience, so he called him by his name. Go forth to the land of vision that I will show you. Go quickly. And so it is in that spirit that we enter onto this pilgrimage now, walking around the places that really spoke to Tolkien's heart. Along the pilgrimage of life, we can often encounter the cross. The cross is a place of suffering. It's the place where Christ overcomes all the evil in the world through his own agony. It's a place of pain where even the presence of God seems far. Tolkien experienced these things very deeply, and we see this in all the characters that he created. Those on the side of good must be purged from evil through suffering. Frodo, Aragorn, Gandalf, they all encounter evil and it hurts them, it marks them. And there's great consolation to be found in the illumination that Tolkien finds in his characters. That this suffering is not without meaning. It's a suffering that brings about great good and great hope. And I think when we find the cross in our lives, we can find great consolation in Tolkien's heart. Here at the water's edge, I'm reminded of two fantastic stories that Tolkien told. He told a story of the elves and how they were going west out of Middle Earth, and we sense the decay and the mystery of their passing, and in many ways seeing the fading decays of England, we are reminded of the many beautiful buildings that adorned this land before the Reformation, the monasteries, the cathedrals, and how a liturgy of praise erupted from under their many roofs and steeples to praise the Creator. And here at the water's edge, we remember the joy of many of the characters that Tolkien brought into being. For example, Tom Bombadil and Goldbury, who was called the River Daughter. 
She was a serene and beautiful figure that Tom Bombadil encountered in his many journeys gallivanting around the forest, and he fell in love with her, and every day he would bring her water lilies out of devotion. And in many ways this beautiful image of their love is a great testament to Tolkien's understanding of vocation, and the call of every human being to follow God on a pathway of joy, hope, and love. And I always think when I'm by the river's edge of Tom sensing and seeing the beauty of Goldberry, falling in love and their happy wedding, as Tolkien described it, a merry day indeed. It's wonderful to have a day's walk along the trail, Tolkien's own trail, where he walked the many paths around this beautiful region. Just here at the stream we see a wonderful example of the imaginative landscape that really must have sparked many of the thoughts that came into Tolkien's mind. Perhaps we can see Glorfindel calling down the waters upon the ringwraiths, or just the mere Shire folk making their way out, out of the Shire, out into the mystery of adventure. The late Tolkien scholar Stratford Caldecott always meditated on the power of beauty to transform and heal human lives, and artists of every generation have been drawn to reflect on the fading beauties of their land. None more so than Tolkien, who in Rivendell and Lothlorien could capture the decaying past of the English tradition. We just stopped off at the Shire Burn Arms, which is a pub just opposite uh, Stonyhurst College, where Tolkien sent his two sons, just enjoying a nice meal. And it's a good place to reflect on the hobbits and uh, where they started out in the Shire was a place of comfort and uh, relative um, peace. And uh, there was a great disturbance, really, amidst all that uh, peace when Gandalf the Wizard came and called uh, Frodo out on his adventure. And um, I think adventure is a really good way to think about Catholic vocation, the call that every Catholic has to take up uh, the cross of Christ in their life and go on a great journey outside of the self. So it's a great way to end our journey here at the Shireburn Arms. We've stopped along the trail to be in the presence of Our Lady, the Blessed Mother of God, who Tolkien was so deeply devoted to. Often in his writings he would translate the Catholic prayers into the Elvish tongue, the tongue he had invented within Middle-earth to represent the elves, a liturgical creation of his, to a continual praise of Elbereth, a queen of the heavens. When Tolkien was talking about Our Lady in the elven language, he wrote the following words, Aya Maria Quento Eruano. This is the Elven Quenya language for Hail Mary, full of grace, and it's good just to meditate upon Our Lady's presence in the journey of every human being. Always along the way she encourages us to continue to search for Christ in our lives and never to give up even if the suffering is really quite bad.
We've come here to the hidden gem in Manchester, here in the centre of the city. It's a great way to end our journey as we went out onto the trails that Tolkien himself walked to see the beauty of the creation and the beauty of the Creator. It's wonderful now to rest in the presence of Christ himself in the Blessed Sacrament as Tolkien did so faithfully many of the days of his life. He was so devoted to come and see Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament and speak to him tenderly in his heart. What a great place to find comfort and uh, consolation along the journey and adventure of life itself. And for Tolkien, who suffered so much and had so much uh, cause for despair, he always found hope in the presence of Christ himself hidden in the Eucharist. And I want to finish our journey really by reflecting on what Tolkien said about the Blessed Sacrament. He said, out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love upon the earth, the Blessed Sacrament. Why? Because there you will find fidelity, honor, glory, romance. And more than this, you will find death, the divine paradox, that which brings life and gives eternal endurance to all human love upon the earth. Turning now to the current events in Eastern Europe, we invited Dr. Gavin Ashenden to chair a discussion with Father Elias Leitz and Ivo Bendor, managers of EWTN in their respective parts of Europe, regarding the spiritual aspect of what's happening in Ukraine. They identify the deep spiritual divisions in Europe between the declining Christian churches in the West and Russian Orthodoxy in the East. Is this humanitarian crisis we are witnessing a reflection of a deeper spiritual crisis? Hello and welcome. We're very glad you can join us. Uh, we have here today uh, Ivo, who is Head of Eastern Relations for EWTN, and Father Elias, who is Head of uh, EWTN in the Low Countries, uh, and me, Gavin Ashenden. Uh, we're very glad to have you with us. We're going to be discussing what's going on in the Ukraine. And I think, as almost any of our listeners will understand, there are always a series of prisms or lenses through which we can analyse the situation. And we're, we're used to our media giving us perspectives from either the left or the centre or the right, or if we're extremely lucky, a combination. But perhaps one of the most difficult things to do is to bring discretia, discernment, the gift of insight the Holy Spirit provides, and that is what we're aiming to do this afternoon. So let me give you a, a less than adequate synopsis of the political situation as I see it, and one of the things I expect will happen is that we'll need to adjust it in conversation because I will have left things out or said things that other people disagree with or want to modify. But what we have at the moment is two, two different political parties, one from the West and one from the East, the history of the Western relationship with uh, Ukraine really follows the collapse of the wall and the expansion of the EU and NATO. And uh, historically, Ukraine has been a buffer zone. And from the, from, from the point of view of Russia at the moment, uh, the movement of the EU and NATO into the buffer zone is seen as a provocation. There are issues in Russia in terms of the extent to which Vladimir Putin sees himself as representing uh, both a political and a religious or spiritual dimension, and whether or not he brings a sense of holy Russia to political Russia. Uh, and uh, we also, I think, find ourselves discussing uh, the way in which both the East and West disagree about contemporary moral issues and whether or not that plays a part as well. Uh, Father Elias, how would you reframe some of this from a spiritual point of view or from a from a Western Catholic point of view? Well, you see, if I really like, uh, sorry, if I really try to dig deep and, um, yeah, trying to find the deepest uh, causes uh, and, and principles, um, I, I think there is a very, uh, at least the, what we see are the consequences of a very uh, deep spiritual division. Uh, in which the middle of Europe has always been very much involved. Um, I, I, I love to use a term that is not used, used by historians uh, yet. Um, in the middle of Europe, there is this golden shock breaker uh, stretching from, let's say, Tallinn in Estonia, 
um, to, let's say, Schkoder in Albania, taking into account the mountains of northern um, Albania, which is a um, which is a the stretch of Middle Europe, um, which happens to be in majority Catholic, and they have always had to um, to take the shocks from the West. Uh, and the East, whether they were uh, ideological or strategic. And I think this is very much what is going on at the moment. Um, for example, we should not forget that if I look at the, uh, the politics of uh, Brussels of the European Union, which is becoming extremely anti-Christian and extremely anti-tradition, uh, and by by consequence, very anti-Poland and anti-Hungary. Um, these countries are now attacked ideologically. They must follow the uh, Brussels uh, ideology about gender, about the family, uh, about letting in uh, immigration in a completely disordered way. Um, that has been going on for a while, whereas the Ukraine, um, well, I mean, it is taking very harshly uh, unresolved problems of post-Soviet Russia. And um, I, I, I think there is a very deep uh, divide within Christianity uh, becoming visible in a very violent way now in Ukraine. Um, Can I share a perception and ask Ivo to, to comment on it? Um, one of the things that's uppermost in my own mind is the culture wars. And to, to go on from what you were saying, Father Elias, to this, this great sense that what the EU was doing was promoting a, a highly secularized view of, uh, of, of morality, which was seriously anti, antithetic to Christianity. I remember my enormous shock when I read the, the protocol to the EU that was designed to, to express its philosophy that Giscard d'Estaing uh, promoted in the, about 2003 to discover that it had wiped out the whole of Christian history in terms of the self-understanding of how Europe came to be, which I think was a sign of what was coming. Um, but, but as I look at the struggle, I don't see it so much as a struggle between the left and the right, which are, are not very helpful terms anyway, but I certainly see it as a struggle between the values of Christendom as it is in its death throes in the West and, uh, and, and those who are not prepared to give way yet. And whatever you say about Putin, one of the things that he's been expressing publicly, whether he believes it or not, is another matter, but one has to presume he has a reason for saying it, uh, is that he too has been critical of the Western moral agenda as it's been coming to him. Ivo, are we entitled to feel that the moral agenda that the EU has been presenting has met with some resistance, at least setting aside for the moment uh, economic and political ideologies? No. The Soviet Union was historically probably the greatest persecutor of Christianity. Uh, there are thousands of martyrs, hundreds of thousands of martyrs who were uh, murdered by the, by the communist regime that he is uh, clearly a part of still, right? and he wants to restore it, if he's using Christianity to justify his, uh, his expansion and his aggression, that's what it is. It's using it. There is no spiritual dimension in that. There is the tradition of Russia that claims to be the third Rome, uh, but that tradition uh, in, in itself is very dangerous because... Uh, it carries with it the, uh, the sort of Byzantine tradition of Caesaropapism, which really dates back millennia before the create, even the, the, the beginning of, 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 of Christianity. It, is the, uh, it comes from Babylonia and ancient Egypt, where rulers were gods, and they had the divine sanction to rule. And... Uh, and the, the subjects were just that. They were subjects. They were not human. So I, I see, of course, I understand what you're saying. You're saying that Putin is an, an unreconstructed Soviet uh, who is uh, hiding behind some, uh, some other form of 
a persona. Um, but the difficulty with that isn't, is, isn't it, that, that first of all, we might expect him at least to make some apologia for his own values. And if they were those of the unreconstructed Soviet Union, we, we might hear them. But the ones he's chosen to use, you would say disingenuously, and I'm asking whether that's legitimate or not, the ones he's chosen to use are in fact cast in conventional Christian framework for the morality. We, we have the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, albeit with a highly problematic view, relationship with the state, as orthodoxy often has had, uh, 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 backing or walking side by side with Putin at least, certainly not demurring from it. Um, so if, if Putin and the Orthodox Church are, uh, are setting themselves up as having some common cause, in the public sphere and and therefore at least cosmetically neg negating your analysis uh should we believe them or disbelieve them father alas that's a very interesting question um i i i i am I'm, I'm don't want to judge the the personal intentions good or bad will of uh, mr putin um but i think what it would be interesting is to question um, his ideological framework, his paradigm that he has used to rebuild Russia. And then you cannot go uh, around a person of Alexander Dugin, who is uh, a typically uh, modern Russian thinker, who has tried in those years of the 90s and the beginning of the century to reformulate the identity of Russia. And... Um, I, I think you must have studied Alexander Dugin in order to understand the ideology of Putin, whether he believes in it uh, or not. Um, what, what, is, what is very striking in um, regimes like uh, the Soviet Union, Russia today, and even with the Iranian Revolution, is that when you listen to their criticism of the West, there's a lot of truth in it. And we Westerners will say yes, or some, some Westerners, Christian Westerners will say, yeah, true, we're decadent, true, we, we have a, 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 an imperialist vision of, 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 of uh, a market that will spread our form of secular relativism, re relativism uh, through the world, you know. There's a lot of criticism. It's always uttered by people who will not use this critical intelligence on their own behavior or their own ideology. For them, uh, Moscow, not Rome, but Moscow must be the place from where Christianity is to be restored, uh, from the beaches of uh, Ireland on the Atlantic Ocean to the beaches of uh, Sakhalin and Vladivostok in, in the East. And that's, that's the idea they have. You, you suggested that yes, orthodoxy has a weakness in terms of embedding itself in nationalism, and that's obviously true. Uh, there's no doubt at all that that uh, yes, it's nationalism... a consequence of that weakness. Um, well, if, if I was an Orthodox Christian looking at the West and particularly looking, listening to the head of MI6 saying, one of the things we'd hoped was that it, that the influence of EU and NATO was going to uh, increase the influence of this uh, this this secular constrained anthropology, I would say to, to, to the Western Christian voice, well, you failed to communicate the glorious freedom of your Christian anthropology. We, we at least uh, have maintained it. Why have, you, why have we failed? Um, certainly my, my Catholic friends in Poland say they are, that the battle lines are very evenly drawn and they're not at all sure of being able to guard in legislation the, the presumptions of Christian anthropology and Catholic culture. Uh, and and uh, Holland hasn't set us an example in resisting secularism either. Where is the, you know, in answer to either, to either me or to an orthodox interrogator, how, where is the Christian mind holding secularism to account? Well, I, I, I think, uh, Gavin, I think that's our fight. I don't think anybody else is going to solve that problem. We're... It, we are the cause, and we are going to have to solve it. Of course, historically, you, you, you can link this, um, the, the, the sexual problems of the West, if you like, uh, to, to Marxism, because uh, Marxism started as a universal ideology, and so they attacked the family, they attacked sexuality, they attacked fertility, 
and, and we had no arms against it. But this is a wonderful apologia for the Western mind, and I, I, I completely agree. Uh, that appears to me, Putin appears to me to be saying something very similar to you in terms of his defense of the family and of conventional Christian morality against the subversion of the Frankfurt School and liberal ident secular identity politics. Now, um, Evo, as I understood it, you're saying, but, but we can't believe him. He doesn't mean this. See, I'm so impressed by Father Elias's apologia. I want to grab it, put my weight behind it and say, yes, this must exactly be right. So if I then see something similar in orthodoxy happening, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to it sympathetically. But, but you, is your point of view still that you think this is, this is um, unreliable and inauthentic from, from, from or both orthodoxy, uh, Putin and, and perhaps Dugin? Well, uh, I think, I, you know, there, there's this, uh, you know, uh, saying that, you know, hypocrisy is, a, uh, uh, is an homage paid by, by vice to, to virtue. And, and that's, that's a simple, that's the best possible interpretation of uh, what Putin is doing, you know. Uh, again, I, I don't know what's in his soul, but I don't know, uh, but I do know what they did in, uh, under his command in Chechnya. Uh, when the West was completely uninterested, I know what they did in uh, in Georgia, where the West West was semi-concerned, and I know what they're doing under the same banner in in Ukraine. So, uh, you sh you know, we should be judged by our actions, and the actions are quite loud and, and visible, and have been. And uh, and no, 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 no. I mean, that is not to attack orthodoxy as such. Because of course these are two lungs of, uh, of of Christianity. I am not against the Orthodox Church. I'm against evil people using it for their evil purposes. Don't uh, don't put your stamp of approval on things that uh, that are not really within the realm of, of of what the Church should really should really should really concentrate on. Let that be the last word. Thank you both for a very interesting and, and captivating conversation. Thank you for joining us. Full versions of these interviews will be made available shortly on our social media channels. EWTN Great Britain is a self-funded charity. If you would like to support our mission, do visit our website on ewtn.co.uk. Until next time, Goodbye and God bless.